evening, everyone. My name is David Kidd. I'm here on behalf of the Toronto Workers' History Project. The Toronto Workers' History Project acknowledges that in Toronto, we walk upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. Toronto is home to a large indigenous population, including residential school survivors and intergenerational family members who have been impacted by the history and legacy of the residential school system and colonial oppression. The Toronto Workers' History Project recognizes the ongoing discrimination and maltreatment of Indigenous people, peoples and communities in Toronto and across Canada and pledge our collective efforts to address these, these inequities. So as I said before, my name is David. I grew up with stories. My mother, if I was lucky, would read to me at night. And if it was a good week, she would take me and my siblings to the local library where we would hear stories. Now you're in for a treat tonight. We have two special storytellers to talk to you tonight. And these will not be stories of fables or misadventure. These are gonna be stories of truth, recovery, and history of indigenous peoples in our city. Too many of us in our city do not know the histories of Indigenous people, so we are lucky to have two special storytellers here tonight. Tonight, we're going to start with Zachary Smith. Zachary Smith is an Anishinaabe doctoral candidate in the Department of History at the University of Toronto. His research focuses on the histories of Indigenous migration and urbanization in mid-20th century Canada. So Zachary Smith is going to speak first. He's brought some visuals for us to see. Then we have a second speaker, Margaret Salt, and she will give her, you know, will tell us about the Toronto Purchase. And then we're here to take questions or comments from you. So Zachary, it's all up to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to participate today um, and for the hard work that they've put in over the last couple weeks. So the remarks I have prepared today stem from a project that I was a part of uh, not too long ago um, called Talking Treaties. Uh, it was a project by First Story, just mentioned, and the Native Canadian Centre of Toronto. Um, and it was an early attempt or early exploration into uh, Toronto's treaty history. Um, and I was focused specifically on examining some of the agreements made between indigenous nations in the area, which uh, this poster here gestures in the case of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum. Um, that served as a set of guidelines or a framework uh, for peaceful coexistence in the Great Lakes and the evolution of that treaty system as it came to uh, include the French and later the British crowns. Um, so my, mark, my remarks today uh, really do bear the imprint um, of that project and that um, narrow focus. And it's concerned primarily with charting uh, the evolution of political relations um, of the different political communities in the Great Lakes. Um, so while I gesture in the kind of early portion um, of the talk to uh, the broader aspects of the longer arc of indigenous history um, in the region, what I'm really doing is setting the stage uh, for Margaret's talk on the Toronto Purchase and the events surrounding that. Um, so please bear that in mind um, going forward. Uh, so walking in Toronto today, a city of 2.6 million, a home in 150 um, languages, people's memory, ethnicity, religion, and nationality, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that for close to 12,000 years, uh, this territory was home to indigenous peoples and nations. Uh, it was a place lived, farmed, fished, hunted, uh, a place fought and died for, and a place that bears some memories, histories and ancestors of countless generations. Despite this, there are times uh, when we care to look close enough that the legacy of indigenous peoples lingers on um, in sometimes unexpected or unrealized ways, be it the places we frequent, the names we use, or the roads and pathways uh, we walk together. Uh, here, beside and between the streets, uh, adorned with the names of those who colonized and dispossess us, are subtle cues of a much longer and much richer lineage. Uh, streets such as Spadina or Ishpidina, 
uh, meeting a place on a hill. Um, this first image is kind of uh, a grill style uh, reclamation of the streets by Hayden King and Susan White from Ryerson and YouTube, respectively. And a couple years later, it's kind of been institutionalized by the city. Um, and this, I think the bottom one is at um, Spadina DuPont, um, if you care to take a look. Um, another example um, of this uh, cues or reminders um, comes from the long winding road of Kiki on Gaming, uh, which we now call Davenport. Um, this is an Anishinaabe word that means the old portage, and this street was for generations uh, a principal thoroughfare that connected the Humber and Don rivers. And what these maps kind of indicate, uh, the bottom is a survey from 1793, and just below um, the top part there you can see the dotted rows, and that's what's today Davenport. And the above one, I was just pushing around, is 1795. Um, and this is a survey of the burgeoning city of then York, of now Toronto. And last but not least is Toronto itself, uh, a Mohawk word meaning where the trees are in water, uh, referring to the pole and net technique used by the Huron Wenda and Haudenosaunee uh, for catching fish along the Lake Ontario waterfront. The names attributed to the different features of the indigenous landscape serve as descriptive indicators of the specific uses, economic activities, um, and the, in the case of Ishkandida, casual references to the regional topography that reflect not only the time depth of indigenous experience or the abundance um, of resources available to people, uh, but also betrays the vast expanse of accumulated knowledge possessed by the city's early and more recent inhabitants. So it kind of really serves to show an intimate familiarity home. Uh, that being said, the takeaway necessary follows that Toronto is by no means a young city. Um, as John Johnson, who's the lead organizer of First Story and now a professor at Woodward College at the University of Toronto noted, uh, the settler city of Toronto uh, was founded in 1793. It's just a bit older than 200 years old. Um, that represents about a fraction, 1.5% to be example, to be exact, of the area's vast indigenous heritage. Um, and it's a heritage that should be noted that's still unfolding in the, present, in the present. Evidence of this heritage is not always easy to find, however. Um, early lakeside settlements have long been submerged um, as lake levels rose. So lake levels were about a kilometer south of what they were in 1793. Um, while remains of inland settlements, burial grounds, and other aspects of indigenous material culture have had to contend with the systemic destruction that attended the city's growth. Uh, the scale of this destruction um, is not entirely known, um, but a finding in 2007 of uh, the Ipperwash uh, Commission into the, uh, the police killing of Dudley George in 1995 estimated that more than 8,000 archaeological sites were destroyed in the greater Toronto area alone uh, between 1951 and 1991. Uh, the archaeological evidence that does remain, however, is rich, consisting in different parts of the GTA of human tools, spear points and pottery, fossilized remains of games with bone um, that bear the marks of tools and arrows and evidence of over 10 millennia of encampments along the Humber River uh, to the west, all the way to the Scarborough Bluffs to the east. One of the most remarkable, I thought the most remarkable um, archaeological find um, is referenced here, uh, was a discovery in fall of 1908 of some 100 footprints and layers of blue clay. Um, this specifically is from Hanlon's Point, which is on today's um, Center Island. Now, the footprints were of all sizes and included a single print of a child's three foot, uh, a child's foot, three and a half inches long, appear to represent, according to W. H. Cross, the city inspector who witnessed the find, a trail that could have plausibly been a family walking from a hunting camp on the shore of Lake Ontario to what is now downtown Toronto. Uh, the footprints were destroyed in the midst of uh, the construction of the project then. Um, but the sample of the clay in which they were found 
uh, was carbon dated to 10,500 to 11,000 years ago. Um, so if the archaeological evidence is as rich as it is, despite the systemic destruction over the past 200 years of colonial occupation, is remarkable. But it's simply a reflection of the fact that historically the Great Lakes were one of the most densely populated regions of indigenous North America. Second only to what is now coastal British Columbia, and rivaling population densities then found uh, along the coastal seaboard of northeastern North America. Uh, this is just a map um, indicating uh, population distribution. Um, it's important to, to keep in mind these are merely estimates uh, of a region's likely a reasonable carrying capacity um, in light of available water resources uh, and things along that nature. Uh, but it also reflects, I think, uh, the references and writings of explorers, missionaries, traders, colonial officials, and diplomats who frequented the region. That the region was frequented so often not only by different groups of indigenous peoples, but by the Dutch, French, and later English, attests to not only the demographic importance of the region, but also the related fact that Toronto has always been an important node or commercial center. Um, so this is just a map um, indicating the flows of trade uh, historically. Um, I think what it shows by name is where um, products of origin were, were produced. The arrows indicate where they ended up, and the dates beside them are representative of the carbon dates. Um, so you can see this in the south here in the Great Lakes. Um, it's kind of a nodal point coming from many directions. Um, I had with me a second image of more recent uh, trade networks, but I guess I didn't add it. Um, but this is an indication of, of the centrality and importance of the Great Lakes. Um, and what it would have been uh, well known and understood by people in that particular time that much as it is today, the Toronto of the past uh, was characterized by cultural linguistic diversity. Uh, it was a meeting point uh, for people who are both coming and going, as well as a center of trade, commerce, and travel. Um, if we shift gears uh, from this more abstract map, abstract map, and I'm now going to segue to some more political uh, history of the region. Um, so we segue to this, which is a more ground level approximation to what the region looked like politically. Uh, we can see this linguistic and cultural diversity in a bit more detail. So this is a map uh, produced in 1718 uh, by Guillaume uh, de La And so present day Ontario, and what it depicts is the political geography of the region at about or before 1650. Um, so coming from the north, what it has is the Huron Wendat, um, just along the, the east and southeastern shores of Georgian uh, Bay. Uh, and Toronto was part of their cornfields uh, during this period. Uh, we have the Neutral and the Erie, who resided along the north and south shore of Lake Erie. Uh, the Five Nations Confederacy, or Haudenosaunee, uh, here they're called the Iroquois, situated to their east. And surrounding these nations from the west and the north were several Algonquin-speaking peoples, most prominently among them, uh, the Anishinaabe. It's important to note that although territorially defined, each was linked to the other by a sense of trade and diplomatic networks uh, facilitated by the region's vast waterways. And when you're looking at the map, um, the lines you're seeing are just indications of these river, system, river systems that reach deep into the um, interior of the continent. So as important as the region was for what it provided to those who stewarded it, uh, what made Toronto such an important and unique place for indigenous peoples and those who came after was the opportunity the region provided to connect with people uh, and places beyond it. Situated at the mouth of Lake Ontario and home to the Credit, Humber, Tobacook, and Rouge rivers, also the Don, Toronto sat strategically in the gateway through which much of the region's good and people traveled uh, on the way to destinations elsewhere. Uh, as a consequence, control of the region was a critical source of leverage and power, one that people sought to wield and others sought to overcome. What made Toronto so strategic, as best evidence um, in this uh, image right here, 
which is a trail map of the Toronto Carrying Place. Um, so this trail offered and established for those who control this the only direct inland route to the markets, peoples, and resources of the Upper Great Lakes. And as evidence, it's important as evidence uh, by the range of peoples who set up shop at its mouth. So you see at the bottom there, uh, Fort Toronto, uh, French trading stations, uh, Mississauga villages, Haudenosaunee villages, um, and later the British uh, set up shop there as well. Um, what he also shows is the route up to the Holland River. Uh, from Holland River, you would uh, turn right or east. Uh, that would get you to Lake Simcoe, and Lake Simcoe, you would follow the road that works you there into the interior of the continent. Uh, so it's an important uh, gateway. Uh, so in 1649, uh, the competition for exclusive control over the region its beaver trails, pelts, and trails, such as those in the Toronto Carrying Place, uh, erupted into war. Uh, here are the tensions that exist between the Haudenosaunee, the Europe Wendat, and their Anishinaabe neighbors was exacerbated by the introduction of European trade goods, weapons, missionaries, and disease, which in the latter half of the century that preceded the war uh, had stabilized the region of delicate balance of power. In the years that followed, the Huron Wendat and Neutral, uh, already weakened by disease and divided amongst themselves, uh, were dispersed and or adopted uh, in the course of repeated Haudenosaunee attacks north of Lakes Ontario and Erie. While the Anishinaabe allies were driven back to the shores of the Great Lakes, uh, principally Lake Huron and Superior. So thereafter, the Haudenosaunee relaxed the full and exclusive control over Southeast Ontario including what is now Toronto and the rich hunting grounds. So if you contrast the Haudenosaunee here to the south, uh, this just gives an indication of the movement of this time um, north of uh, Lake Ontario um, and encompassing the region where we are today. So here in the 1650s and 1660s, as was shown uh, just a minute ago on the Toronto Carrying Place map, and a bit more detail here. Uh, the Haudenosaunee established a series of seven, seven villages along Lake Ontario's North Shore, uh, across an area that extends from today's Napanee in the east to modern-day Hamilton in the west. Uh, each of these villages were strategically located along the extensive fur trade network during this period, and at the base of trails that led into the continental interior. Um, principally, for, if we're talking about Toronto specifically, it was the Seneca, uh, which was the largest and most powerful and westernmost nation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and uh, who had the most impact on Toronto, establishing three villages on its north side, with two in Toronto itself. Uh, here's a close-up of kind of the geographical extent of Haudenosaunee power in this uh, particular time. Um, so some of the villages here see, are not far from the carrying place. And so it was in a perfect position to control movements up and down the trail, and as I mentioned before, into Lake Simcoe, Georgia Bay, and beyond that, the Upper Great Lakes. Um, there was also consideration that uh, led British colonial officials in, in the period, uh, century following, to consider this uh, an important place in which to establish York. So this map is from 1755, um, of the Great Lakes, drawn by Jacques Nicolas Galin. Um, and the areas of red uh, to show the range of control over the waterways, lakes, and leading west uh, into the interior. So the foundations for peace in the region, which began in earnest in the 1680s, culminated in 1701 with the conclusion of not one, but three separate peace treaties as Haudenosaunee defenses along the North Shore crumbled. The first of these, and perhaps the best known, uh, was the Regional Peace Conference, of which this document here uh, records, held in Montreal in August 1701. Uh, it was sponsored by the French colonial governor and, its, and his British uh, colonial counterpart. Uh, the Great Peace of Montreal was attended by 1,300 representatives uh, from over 20 indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee. And the intention here was to ratify their commitment to regional peace, free trade, and security. Uh, a separate uh, treaty about a month after this uh, had been written was between the Haudenosaunee and the British um, 
September of 1701, called the Nant Venturi, and that was intended to um, sign up the British as a protector or guarantor of Haudenosaunee access to their hunting grounds north of the Great Lakes. Uh, but these two documents were not the only one, um, or only record of the peace made in that year, and certainly not the only record made of the uh, peace between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. Maybe not even the most important. Together in council, the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe made a separate, uh, localized peace, uh, of which Toronto uh, is covered. As part of this agreement, the Haudenosaunee withdrew from territories captured north of the Great Lakes in 1649. Uh, recognized the jurisdiction of the Mississauga, uh, which is a European term for the Anishinaabe, who in the 1690s had taken, taken control of the North Shore. At the same time, however, each agreed that the territory and its resources uh, would be shared free from the claims of either side for exclusive use and control. Uh, so as the name of the agreement itself implies, uh, a central feature of Great Lakes diplomacy uh, was the shared use of a highly contextualized diplomatic language, um, an associated set of symbols and practices meant to illustrate the commitment of Great Lakes peoples to regional peace, alliance, and friendship. Uh, the widespread use of metaphor, for example, to describe political relationships, uh, and this is seen, just going back to uh, the Wampum Belt, the Bishop of Spoon. Uh, this stood as a metaphor for both the land and how each was to conduct themselves upon it. The dish, a uh, common hunting ground, and the spoon denoting the ability to freely hunt and eat together in peace. The second element was the exchange of wampum. Uh, and this was customarily employed as kind of a mnemonic aid uh, to re record events of significance. Uh, the symbols were woven onto wampum, were designed to convey specific meanings, in the oral tradition, uh, they see that these meanings were preserved. Its main political function, however, um, was to represent materially the morally binding nature of an agreement or promise and sanctify one's word and practice. And secondly, thirdly rather, uh, there was an emphasis on treaty renewal. So these were not one-time transactional agreements, uh, but they were living agreements. The Renewal Council for example, in 1840, of which the description here stems, um, was the fourth time since 1701 that the Dish of Plunkton Treaty uh, had been renewed between Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee. And finally, um, there was an understanding of treaties as sacred covenants. So the introduction to this uh, renewal ceremony in 1840 begins with the speaker noting that the Great Spirit has brought us together of peace. Uh, the final, I guess, the most significant aspect, at least for the pre-Toronto Purchase history of the Great Lakes, uh, was the importance of this gift exchange. Uh, presents were regarded by Indigenous nations in the Great Lakes as a form of rent, uh, which they expected pay in return for use of their territories, <coughs> uh, which they regarded as their own and for guarantees of safe passage through it. The, threat, the French in particular, uh, mindful both of the power of indigenous peoples and their dependence on them, uh, paid careful attention to this most important of diplomatic protocols, uh, as it constituted recognition of the sovereign jurisdiction of indigenous nations. The British, however, upon their assumption of control over Quebec um, after the defeat of New France in 1760, moved immediately to cease their distribution while also proving negligence in their control over unsanctioned settler incursions into indigenous territory. Uh, the result was the eruption of widespread armed resistance in the Great Lakes, as a loose confederation of nations led by the Ottawa chief Pontiac campaigned to rid the region of the British presence. Now, what this map serves to indicate is that in a matter of months beginning in May 1763, uh, the Seneca, the Anishinaabe, and the Allied nations attacked all 14 British forts in the region. Uh, they captured eight, uh, forced them to break to abandon another, and they also decimated British settlements and untreated land, untreated lands. Although ultimately unsuccessful in eliminating the British from the region, 
The demonstration of power undertaken by the Confederacy did fundamentally alter British practice in the region and led directly to the issuance of the Royal Proclamation seven months later. The proclamation effectively recognized Aboriginal title to lands west of the Appalachian Mountains, uh, barred settlements uh, and trade without crown license west of it. Um, but it was just a unilateral piece of British legislation upon which the nations of the Great Lakes that would have to be persuaded to accept. And this here is kind of a map of the partition of the continent that the world population was intended to set in order. So on the eastern seaboard are the 13 British colonies, what would then become the United States. And everything west of that, you can see, is land reserved for Indians um, as their hunting grounds. Toronto and the Great Lakes are, are included in that. Uh, so to gain a sense of British entry in the region, indigenous leaders throughout the interior were invited to attend a conference to be held the following summer at Niagara to discuss proposals for a new relationship between themselves and the British Crown. Billed as a treaty of offensive and defensive alliance, negotiators at Niagara were regarded as the most representative gathering of indigenous nations ever assembled. As approximately 2,000 leaders uh, from 24 nations uh, were in attendance. Here, William Johnson, the superintendent of the British Indian Department, uh, did not directly translate the, the terms of the Royal Proclamation, but reiterated the Crown's commitment to the principle of non-interference and consummated the agreement according to indigenous diplomatic traditions, language, and protocol, uh, of which these two Wampum belts are represented. Presidents were exchanged as were the Walton Bell signaling the extension of the covenant chain and the alliance based on the principles of sovereign equality and mutual recognition first established between the British and the Hohenstaufen in 1664 into what is today Canada. So at the time of the American Revolution uh, in 1776, the Mississaugas and the New Credit uh, were sovereign autonomous allies of the Crown and were regarded as such. Uh, the alliance was called upon and indeed upheld uh, during the period of the American Revolution as Mrs. August stood by their ally in that particular fight. The alliance was then called upon at the conclusion of that war in 1783 um, as Britain sought to resettle uh, refugee loyalists south of the, of the border. Um, and that kind of sets the stage for uh, the Trump purchase. Um, so what I wanted to do today was just give a bit of a background into the uh, Great Lakes political history leading up to the purchase of, of the, the Toronto Purchase, and a little bit of indigenous history, history more broader, uh, more broadly in the region. And I'll not pass on to Margaret, who will elaborate on how the Mississaugas dealt with Britain's demands for lands and surrenders. Thank you so much. So now we're going to hear from Margaret Salt. Margaret served 2015 to 17 as a counselor for the Mississauga and the Accredited First Nation, and she is a lifelong resident. She currently is back as the Director of Lands Research and Membership for the Mississauga and the Accredited First Nation, uh, a position she has held since 1977, 1977, in which she has successfully settled three land claims. She has been doing public speaking on the history of the First Nations for many, the First Nation for many years now, and has produced several booklets as public education tools, as well as a video of New Credits history. She graduated with honors in the Personal Support Worker Program from Mohawk College in 2009, and she enjoys both her careers very much, and when not helping in the community, she enjoys baking, reading, and spending quiet time at home with visits with her three sons and grandchildren. Margaret, very, we're very gracious that you're here tonight with us. Good evening. Um, that was a very informative talk um, from um, Zachary. And I took some notes because I found it very interesting. As you'll see on these maps, there was no borders um, on that, those maps. So I was um, interesting. I got to find out my notes. 
I was interested in the talking trees because that's what um, I work with. I started with the band in 1977 um, doing research for land claims um, <coughs> to submit them to the government. And when I started, um, I didn't know actually what I was getting into. Um, my husband at the time says, um, there's a job coming up and it's research and it does, it's a lot of reading and you like to read, so why don't you put in for it? <laughs> so I never, I never finished, I finished grade 11, but I did like to read. And so I put in for it, and uh, if I had to do an interview today, I probably would not have got the job. But my thing was, um, they asked me, my job interview was, um, can you type? And I said, um, I've, been, I've been enrolled in Mohawk College, because we had Mohawk College on the First Nation. I signed up for typing, and they said, um, do you have a car to get to work? And I said, yes, I do. And they said, do you have a reliable babysitter? And I said, yes, I do. So that was it. That's why I got the job. <laughs> um, little did I know what I was getting into. But um, I learned the, a lot of the history. I, I've been blessed with a good memory. And so for two years, I read. I went to um, Toronto Archives and to Ottawa, and I transcribed all the records. And so when I transcribed them, I was, that's my learning, and I was, was learning the history. And I found it very fascinating. So the first month I went, went to council, they said, well, do you have a claim ready? I'm like, no. <laughs> um, so I was, I would just, my orientation was I was taken up the stairs in the council house and the late girl said to me, she says, this is your office. You start work at 8.30 and you're done at four. You have a half an hour lunch, see ya. And I'm like, okay. So I had a whole office to myself. So I start looking through the files. And that's why I said, I, I went to a course um, at the Union of Ontario Indians and, and um, to navigate around the archives. So that was very interesting. So I guess I was in the school of hard knocks and uh, I had to learn trial and error as I went, but um, that's very good too because I did in 1986, I went, the council let me go back and part time and get my grade 12, so I got that. And uh, I took a lot of courses. Um, I've been to a lot of, um, a lot of classes on stuff, and then in 2009, um, my mom and dad were getting older, and so I said to my mom one day, I says, um, who's gonna look after you and dad? She looks at me, she said, you are. I said, oh, okay. So I always said that if I could go and get my PSW, my personal support work to look after them, that I would do it. So about a year later, uh, Mohawk College put a course out called um, for two years, two nights a week, PSW. So I had opened my big mouth and told my co-worker that that's, if that ever happened, I would take it. And so she, looked, she says, Margaret, there's a course here. Look at what it is here. And I thought, oh, I shouldn't have said anything. But I took it and I enjoyed it very much. I really enjoyed it. So I've continued on on that, so I, I'm still in research, my full time, I say my real job, and then my PSW that I do, I still look after that. So, um, but he says I've been here um, since 1977. Our organization has grown from two people to over a hundred um, people. We started out in the council house and we now have an administration building, a daycare, an elementary school. Um, our new community center, our social services, um, and we have a plaza where our gas station, variety stores off of the number six, and um, a commercial building. And we have, um, in my office, we've moved, and so now we, we're expanded a lot. So we've, um, I settled actually four land claims because when we did the Toronto purchase, we threw in the Brant track um, what the government calls bundling. So we put that in with it to, um, to just put them together. This, this land claim 
the trauma purchase. I brought some books over there who have it uh, for anybody. And and I uh, I think I got some more in my bag. Oh, no, in that box. In that box. Okay. And then there's other, it's another one called The History of the Mississaugas. And that one was, a re that's more of, um, oh, they're all gone. So the brown one is a history of, from a report that we done for hunting, fishing, and gathering. So that's more um, historical on uh, there. So I like, to, I like to do that one. It was from a practice report. Um, one of our guys, of our band members, got caught for fishing with two lines and a, two lines. <laughs> and so we were, we were at a impasse, I guess, with the, with the government because we wanted them. We had went to them and asked them for some money to do some research. And they told us no. So um, how that happened was, so anyway, we went there and they said no. So we went to, to the Ministry of Natural Resources because they had put um, an area on us 60 kilometers around our First Nation that they, we could hunt and fish. And our chief said, no, we don't accept that. You never asked us. So anyway, we were going back and forth and that court, ca that court case came up and so we, we went to bat for the band member, but we always have an, another motive. And so what we wanted to do was, we wanted to establish what, where our hunting was, where our fishing was, where our band members could go, where they could gather. And so um, we went to the ministry and says, can you um, give us some money to do this report? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So we had, so what did we be, so we got money from them to do a report. So then the federal government comes to us and they said, what did you do that for? And we said, what? And they said, what did you go to them and ask for this money? You said, well, you didn't want to play ball, so we took our ball and we went someplace else to play. So we ended up getting our whole report done um, through the federal government and the provincial government was a joint. So it was supposed to determine where our area was where our mem members could hunt and fish. And so when we were done it, we took it back to the uh, provincial government and said, here's the report. Um, give it to m &R because it was supposed to be an education tool to, to train the wardens um, where the Mississaugas could hunt and fish without being charged. And so they came back to us and they said, well, we don't, we don't, um, the ball's in your court now. And we, and so they would make a decision on it. So we, there was two maps in there and we says, okay, we agree with A and B, maps A and B. Because we couldn't do the map of just the Mississaugas of the credit, we had to do it as the Mississauga nation. Um, so that's the way we went at that one. And so that was a result of that little, because the report's thick, but we wanted it as an education tool so anybody could pick it up and they could read it. Um, so that's what we did with that one. And it has the newer map in the middle of it that shows our treaty areas, our traditional and treaty, our traditional lands is 3.9 million, which is in there, you'll see there's a part up in the northern that's not under treaty that we'll probably be dealing with right now. Um, later on, and so we've, um, um, we have those, so over the years at working, we have did a lot of um, publications. We used to have a 11 and a, eight and a half by 14. We used to photocopy it, photocopy and photocopy it. So then we asked for some money, so we had some nice booklets done. We did a video on the, it was supposed to be the first part of a, a, a political tape. The next one would have been a political, but it went hand in hand with the Toronto Purchase so that we could put pressure on the, on the federal government to negotiate the claim. So when, when we started this claim, there's a chronology in, in the back of the, of the book that um, we had to go under the specific claims and that means there's a, a breach of fiduciary obligation, um, um, a legal disposition of land. There's four categories, so we have to fit our claim within, within that. Um, the non-fulfillment of a treaty, 
uh, the mishandling of Indian funds. It's all on that page. So when we do a claim, those those are what we have to prove to say this is the basis of our claim. And all of our claims are um, pre-confederation. So that meant prior to 1990, we weren't able to to um, put any of our claims in. The only claims we could put in for, like example, the 200 acres, that was done in 1820. Um, it was reserved out of there. So the only claim, so instead of 200 acres, we had to, we only could take in, I think it was like 79 acres in there that was sold after um, Confederation and they used the date of 1851. And so, they wanted us to surrender the full 200 acres, but only negotiate and comp get compensation for the 79. And we said, no, we're not gonna do that. So we never did it. We got kicked out of the process because along came 1990. And um, 1990 was OCA, and they put in the Indian Commission, Claims Commission. And so when our claim was rejected, it was submitted in 86, 1986 by the Mississauga Tribal Claims Council, and it was rejected in 1993. So the Mississauga P Tribal Claims Council requested that the ICC, the Indian Claims Commission, do an inquiry in 1993, but it was closed due to inactive activity by the uh, Tribal Claims Council. But what happened in that time was, um, um, the, the Williams Treaty um, came along and so the other, that's why it was sitting there, but because the 1923 Williams Treaty was signed by the other Mississauga nations, um, Scuba, Alderville, um, Hiawatha, and Herb Lake, they never, they signed the Williams Treaty with Rama or Georgina Island, um, Beausoleil, and Christian Island, they signed Chippewas, so it was the Mississaugas and the Chippewas that signed the, Missis the Williams Treaty. And New Credit didn't because in 1919, they met in Saline and they asked, um, the A.E. Williams was the commissioner, they asked, they knew what land and they just were talking about the northern land. So if you look at a Williams Treaty, there's the northern lands and there's the southern lands that's coming along Lake Ontario. And when they, and so I said, the new credit did, didn't, wasn't there because they were looking at the nor northern land. So they said, we trust these guys that they're gonna look after it because they were disputing with the Iroquois or the Six Nations at that, at that time of where they were settled. So they said, we're gonna let it go. They're only talking about the northern land. So they didn't, um, they weren't there in 1923, but between 1919 and 1923, it's at the 11th hour, the government decided that, hey, there's unsurrendered land down here, we have to get that. So in the Williams Treaty, they put a, um, a, a basket clause in there, what they called it, and it was a cleanup treaty, so that any unsurrendered land, it was thrown in that basket clause and said it was surrendered. So what happened was New Credit wasn't there, and the other thing that they did was they gave up their, their hunting and fishing of the hole in their area. And they didn't know that because when they talk about the treaty and they had pre-meetings and what they agreed upon was extra money, extra lands, hunting and fishing, and so that didn't happen. Um, in 1923, so they really didn't see the document or weren't told because they, you gotta remember they still didn't really understand English and what was going on in there because how Zachary said they talked about it was rental uh, on the lands, it was um, approval for them to cross through their lands peacefully and stuff, so they didn't have the concept of what this land ownership was. They found out later on, but it, with the Williams Treaty, that's why New Credit wasn't there, so out of sight, out of mind, they didn't bother with them. But as soon as um, the, the Mississaugas of the River Credit found out that they had surrendered their lands, their southern lands that came in to the Toronto Purchase, in the middle you'll see where the Toronto Purchase is on the east of there, next to the Rouge Valley, there's 63,000 acres in there that's on over that, that's on surrender. 
So we have a claim in today for that unextinguished um, value, and as, um, we put it in as claim of claim of a third kind. So, um, so they dealt with. That's why the Williams Treaty um, was. So with them signing that, and New Credit <laughs> did go in with. They didn't sign it, but when they reunited in 1985-86, they said we're going to take these claims in. And that's submitted to the federal government. We're going to take them in, and they took new credit and moved Deer Point in with them. And they said, okay, whoever can open the door, if we get it open, you guys can come in with us. And if you guys can get in, we'll come in with you. So what happened, they submitted the claim, and they and they kicked new credit, the government kicked new credit out, and they because they did, weren't signatories, and they kicked Moose Deer Point out because they said they weren't, they, they were imports from someplace else. So they kicked, kicked us out. So that was an advantage to us because um, we were able to take our claims and because uh, the government recognized and the British Crown recognized the Mississaugas as the owners by conquest, the same way they got their land by conquest um, through the Three Fire Confederacy formed and could push the Iroquois back into the United States. So they were recognized as owners of the land so new credit was able to take their claim in and they, we always left the door open for the other first nations um to say the other mississaugas to say if you want to come in you can have we left the door open for you if you want to have a claim to that we left that open and so um we negotiated we entered in with the indian claims commission into an inquiry and they took it on but you have to understand too what we were going against because the Indian Claims Commission was put in in 1990, but they didn't have any power, I say they didn't have any teeth to make the federal government um, move on anything. We could do all the research and we could submit it into the ICC, do an inquiry, and if the Indian Claims Commission made a recommendation to the government, the federal government, the government could say, Thanks very much, but we're not going to negotiate this claim. And there was, they had no power to make them move on it. So we were lucky. We went through the inquiry, and, and what happened was we had negotiating sessions on it. And we were able to um, stay in there. And so the, um, the federal government accepted our claim to negotiate it. And we so once we started negotiating it, we jumped right into um, compensation. So in, it took us a long time because we started this in 1998 and it was 2010 when we um, actually reached an agreement with them on there. But, but during this process was very interesting and I sat through it. I'm probably the only one in our council now that has sat through, I can go through it. I did a paper on all our land claims and all the differences that we had. But this one was really interesting. Um, when the um, DOJ, the Department of Justice, their negotiator, he had to write, the, their lawyer had to write a legal opinion. We had to give them our legal opinion, but when they did a legal opinion, they didn't have to, they, we couldn't see it. But he had to give it to his peers, his lawyer friends there, peer review, and he said when they, when they read it, it was like a book that they couldn't put down. It was so interesting. Maybe one day we'll get it, we can make a movie on it. But he said it was really interesting, they just could not put it down. And he was, he was so surprised that there was so much documentation on a treaty or a transaction that was supposed to happen in 1787. So what we found out through through that, and we had put our claim in and, and they had to do counter research on it, and we did some joint papers, we did the joint papers on the beneficiaries, and we did, um, they told us they, that they did, in 1805 they didn't have a banking system. We said, come on, you must have had something in place, you had these things, you were doing something with our money. So anyway, we did find out, we did a, we did a um, paper on it and they found out that they did have, um, they did have a banking system and they paid 6%, so they had to 
because they said like, okay, we're only give, give you money that was there in 1805, oh, whatever, <laughs> and not add any interest oh. on there. So we had to fight with them again on that. So we won, we got the joint paper done. But this claim was so interesting. Um, you, you can read it in here, but some of the, some of the things that, that went on in there, and it was interesting that you seen this map up there that um, in 1793 that there was lots being surveyed and they were being sold. So in 17, after 1787, they thought they had a treaty, but there was a land clerk going, looking in the files and he come across this one and he's like, there was no land description in it. So he goes, to he's the higher ups and he says, there's no land description on here, so you don't own the land. You don't own where you're gonna build York or where they were selling the land and everything. So they were going, there's, co there's correspondence. We actually have the documentation and our lawyer says um, that they recorded history very good and um, kind of come back to bite them in the, in the end. <laughs> but um, they recorded everything and they recorded back and forth, letters going back and forth saying, you gotta tell them. And the other one said, no, no we're not gonna tell them. So they decided because they didn't want an uprising that they would um, take the treaty again. But they didn't tell the Indians what was going on that the, the Mississauga, they didn't tell them that they didn't have ownership to that land, but they were selling it. So in 1805, they, they took it, they took the treaty again. But what they did was they, this is how good they kept records. They kept records of, there was four maps. There was four maps, A and B and C and D. And they said, okay, if the Indians say they had, they surrendered this, these two maps go together. If they say this one, these two maps go together. Because there was a, where there was a fight in 1788, Aikinson was gonna take, a, take the um, survey. And they actually had to call the Butler's Rangers out because the chiefs wouldn't let them go further than the, the Humber. And so that was our dispute too about the islands not being included because it didn't go far. The, the land shouldn't have went to the, to the dawn. And so anyway, they were, the rangers were brought in. And if you see in this map in the middle here, they only went so far. And then on this side to the Humber River, there's a thing where they only went up so far because the rangers pulled out and the surveyor pulled out because he thought he was gonna get, get um, the Indians were gonna come and kill him because they couldn't. So then it ended up being um, 14 by 28 and they don't know how it got that, that big because when 1796 they went to Sir John Johnson and they said, when you met with the Indians at the Bay of Quinty, what did you get from them? What land did you talk about? He said, I think we talked about a 10 by 10, 10 miles by 10 miles, which would have been this little one in here. And he said, I think two to four miles on each side of the carrying place, right up to Lake Simcoe, because at the head of Lake Simcoe was another 10 by 10, so that's usually what they took. So how it got to 250,000 acres was anybody's guess how they got it. So when they took the treaty in 1805, they ended up showing on one map probably that map, but they kept records to show that they got four made. So we didn't know how that happened. So that was about, um, that was the part to say, okay, what did you take? And so then they, they expanded in 1805. So now I gotta remember where I was going with this. Okay, so the, so anyway, the survey took done, they took the, they took the um, lands, and in that time, there was a lot going on because um, the government wanted them to settle. And so the Mississaugas, even though they wanted them to settle, they always um, traveled as a Mississauga nation. They did. They settled here, whatever. Um, some of them stayed more up, up north, 
and um, you credit ones were the ones that came down down further but when you talk about the royal proclamation we were talking about that um, probably just yesterday when I did a talk at the island is is uh, when you do, when you talk about all these things that are put in place of how we're going to live they were done without our consent they were all done without no consultation it was these people sitting you know I, I was told them yesterday I said you know what I said the Indians were all hunting and fishing and surviving living off the land doing what they had to do well these people and I say the royal proclamation was put in place because the British Crown seeing their opportunity to make money and it was the land of milk and honey because they came in here they took the royal proclamation of how they were to take lands from the first nations so at any time and that's where how the treaties were made that there was there were guidelines to say it had to be at an assembly of the principal men they had to sign off on it and and so a lot of times in the treaties that didn't happen they signed them and then like you say you have, have any of you have ever seen a treaty how legal it is how are the Indians supposed to know what ceded, surrender, and all this, what they talked about? And today you can't even, you gotta take a lawyer to tell you what, what they say on there. So that was a, a, was a big thing because every, everything they put in place was always for the benefit of the government. And they took on, they were, they talked about, we have to look after these savages and we have to civilize them. Well, you know what, we were organized the First Nations were organized, they had their own justice system, they had their own government in place. They didn't need these people coming in, um, telling them how they were going to live. But see, then the Indian Act come in place, the, all these acts that came into place to say how we were supposed to live our lives, put us on reserves, and, and we said, why do we have to submit land claims? It shouldn't be us proving that this land was our, you know it was our, the indigenous people's land. You should be proving to us how you got ownership and that you own this land. We never got any resources from it. You know, so, um, I always tell people, I said, you know what? I said, don't ever think that the First Nations are here um, for handouts because we never had access to the resources to our land. And if they sold land at these public auctions, say if they got a hundred dollars for for land, then the First Nations might have got a dollar. And I said that still works the same way today. You know, like the Indian Affairs was put in place to protect and look after the interests of the First Nations. Well, that never happened. It was never ever. It was way back in 1820. Was that get rid of the we got an Indian problem? They said get rid of the Indians. You know, and so from 18, the 1800s, we're still surviving yet, and we're growing, the fastest growing. Um, so this this treaty was uh, was a good treaty, was not a good treaty, but it was, um, it, it had a lot of history in there, and of how the lands were. And so I tell people, reading all this stuff, the Iroquois and the, uh, Mississaugas met on three occasions. They met in 1784 when they were with the American Revolution. The British Crown came to the Mississaugas and they said, um, we, we have to, we, we got to get land. If we lose the war, we got to get land for the Iroquois. We got to get land for the United Empire Loyalists. And I was reading that one day and I'm thinking like, hmm, regardless, if they took the treaty with them, they got the land regardless if they won or lose. They got three million acres of land. And so what happened was the Iroquois came and they met with the Mississaugas. And they said, asked them to give, give the land up for them to come and live there. So, and they talked about it and they said, well, I guess we'll do that. The Mississaugas decided that they would do that so they could, um, if there was ever a war again that at least they'd have other natives there um, um, to, to join with them so then they met again in 1840 
they met again at the River Credit, and uh, in the meantime, the River Credit people were, were trying to um, get deeds to their lands because they would never get, they never could have deeds for their lands. They had reserves at the 16 Mile, um, Bron Bronte Oakville, and the River Credit, and they settled on the Credit River. And so they, they, they met again there because the Iroquois found out that they were looking for land. So they joined together and they said, they come to them and said, we heard you're looking for a, play, a home and we remember what your ancestors did for us, so we want you to come and, um, and live with us. But <laughs> there were some catches in that. Um, so they did, they sent out a delegation because prior to that, they were gonna, the Mississaugas, there was this really nasty man, Bonhead. Um, he was there and he wanted all the Indians to be moved to Manitoulin Island. And it was the River Credit people that sent a delegation there because they had started farming, they were adapting in the 1820s because the government felt that they were going to, um, in five years there were gonna be no more Mississauga of the Credit because of, of alcoholism, the um, disease that they had no immune system against. Um, they were, so they were drastically, they were reduced probably to one third of their original population. So there was like 200 people there. And so they thought in five years, they're not gonna be any more people. So the government as it is of the day, they didn't say, oh, let's look after these people. They said, um, get their land. We want the rest of their land. So there was a lot of things going on at that time because, um, Peter Jones was born. His mom, mom was a Mississauga woman and his dad was Augustus Jones, a land surveyor. Peter and John Jones. He had, when he was 14, his dad took him to live with him. And you gotta see these alliances. Probably Zachary knows this, but this, it's amazing when you see the alliance of these people working together of what they did. Joseph Brandt um, was, was one of the spokesmen spokesperson for the Mississaugas and they disregarded him but Joseph Brad married um, Molly no Joseph Brad married Molly Brad that's his sister yeah but anyway no jo no it was Augustus Jones married Joseph Brad's sister and and um, so what happened was um, he had um, Peter and John, so he had made a set settlement. He had a home, so when he knew what they were doing and saying, well, the Mississaugas are gonna be gone, they, he took his boys, John and Peter, and he said, we're gonna take them and we're gonna um, help them that, because for 14 years they lived with their mom, learned the traditions and all the things, the culture of the Mississaugas. So when they were 14, they, they left and were brought up in the Mohawk with, um, so there's that Peter Jones and Joseph Brent and there's Alliance, which was a strong Alliance too. Um, so when he was 23, he was converted to Christianity Methodist. And so he, so the government thought, oh, we have an Indian minister. So what they did was, they called it the credit experience, and they said, okay, we're gonna send him in there, and we're gonna get him to assimilate and turn them off Christians, and we're gonna get rid of them. There'll be no more Indians. So but what happened was their plan backfired on him because he, um, for 10 years, he looked after the people, and then the next 10 years, he went to the government and said, okay, we made treaties, it's pay up time. So they tried to get him out of there so many ways. They tried to get Peter Jones and his uncle John, John Joseph Sawyer, his brother John, all helped him um, on there. So they said, um, Peter Jones is gonna be our chief. And they said, the government said, no, he's not. And they said, yes, he is. And they were going back and forth and they finally said, I don't care what you say, he's gonna be our chief he's going to be our spokesman so they they actually let him be it and he made three trips um, to the to the visit the queen and that's where he met his wife Liza Fields and they came back in 1833 they were married so he 
was a big part of getting like a lot of the claims because when they did the 200 acres, when they did those, those claims, they were all really well documented. And we have files upon files of the, of the Toronto purchase. So now we, we've, um, we revisited the Toronto, the um, Treaty 22 and 23. We got a claim on that again. Uh, we have uh, the Rouge Valley, which we said is on this unextinguished. Um, so, so the gov the policy says that their policy says with land claims that it's compensation only, meaning monetary compensation. And so now, because of the duty to consult, and we've come a long ways, we're looking at creative ways of how to work. Um, with, with, with the government, with different businesses and stuff that, you know, is a duty to consult now if anything's going within our traditional territory. We're situated right in the middle of the most developed land and so um, we're doing a lot of that now and we also have a claim, a water claim. And when uh, one of the elders, Gary Sue, was doing the water, water uh, he was doing some ceremonies on the island yesterday and he got talking about the roles of the men, what their roles was, and he talked about the um, the women's roles. The man was the provider, and the women pretty well. well. You all know the women is they say the man's the head, but the woman's the neck that turns that head. So it always was that way. So so the women are responsible for the water because they're the life givers and they look after those things. So we have a claimant for, for the water lake, of Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and all the, the flood plains and the wetlands and everything. Because um, when we were doing some research, I think it was at the Burlington track, the Brack track there, um, the chiefs were gathered there in the government, they were talking about the, what the lands they wanted. And so they says um, that, uh, do you want the water? And they said, no, we don't want the water, we want the land. So we put in a water claim, and so I'm sitting there thinking when Gary said that, a kind of a light went off in my head, and I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting. Because the water belongs to the woman. And so instead of the men negotiating and talking about the water claim, it should be the women talking about the water claim because that's their role. And um, I got off track there, so I gotta tell you the third time the Mississaugas um, got together was when once they moved to U Credit, what is our Indian Reserve now, they moved there and um, they were disputing about the lands because the land was given to the Mississaugas as a gift. So probably around in um, 1896, new blood in the Confederacy come along and they said, no, we want you off the land. They said, no, we, we, um, we you gave this to us. So they kept fighting back and forth again. So in 1903, the Mississaugas actually paid. Um, they got together again and because of the Royal Proclamation, Indian Affairs jumped in and, and because they had made the deal between the Mississaugas and Six Nations, they got together and they made this deal. And in the fair jumps in and they said, you guys can't do that because this is the way, you know, you got to surrender and all this. And they said, no, nah, we're, we pay, we're paid for the land. They gave it, but we did never, the new credit never got clear title to the land. So that's why they weren't at the Williams Treaty. And so that's how they own their land. The same as Six Nations, I say they own the land, the same as Six Nations. Um, lock, stock, and barrel because theirs was a grant under the Haldeman. And so that was the three times they, they um, got together after. And it was interesting when Zachary was talking about because if he, if the Mississaugas were known as the Seventh Nation and the government tried to keep them apart. They knew they were, they were um, natural enemies and they couldn't get along and so what happened was when they became and there's documents that say the Mississaugas was the seventh nation they talk about that treaty where you put your arms together not going to fall through it well the government they still use this it was a term called um, divide and conquer well Indian Affairs still uses that very well today 
with all the First Nations because in anything, that's why they say, why can't you speak with one voice? Well, they could if the government would leave them alone because the thing is, they dangle the carrot, they dangle the carrot, and the for other First Nations will say, well, you know what, we really need that money. And so they'll take it, and the next one will take it. So the ones that want to hold out, they can't because they're defeated because all the other ones, and, and we realize that. We realize that, you know, all the First Nations need, need money. But hopefully, um, coming up now, I'm really excited because there's a new era coming in, a new era, where you know we're there to do business now and we're gonna make our own money and one day we're gonna be able to tell the government, this is what we're gonna do. And we're not gonna go to them and say, can we do this? We're gonna say, we're doing this. And I'm really excited about that because that's a new day coming. I wanna be part of it. I wanna go to land camps because you know what? That's what we gotta do and we gotta train up our, our children to be proud of who they are as Anishinaabe or first any First Nation. They gotta be proud of and know where they came from, who they are, um, and be educated to know that. So my orders were to wrap up. So if anybody has any questions, Listen, thank you. Margaret, thank you so much. <laughs>